Hi, uh, we're here at Daily Clout. My name is Aitana Hecht. I'm here with Dr. Naomi Wolf. She's the CEO of Daily Clout. I'm here with Mr. Josh Yoder, who's a U.S. airline pilot, as well as the president and co-founder of the U.S. Freedom Flyers, and Dr. Thomas Levy, who's a cardiologist who's consulting with the U.S. Freedom Flyers, as well as an attorney at law. So welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having Thank us. Thank you, Aitana. Yeah, and I'll just uh, jump in and chime in now and say, I'm Naomi Wolf, um, welcome. Also, uh, I add my welcome <laughs> to Adonis. Um, I'm really honored to be listening, really, because I'm learning along with everyone else on the live stream. Etana Hecht, along with Mr. Yoder and Dr. Levy, have really um, broken or been, you know, the tip of the spear, as they say, on this incredibly important story about aviation and heart damage. And since um, they're the experts and I'm not, I'm just going to um, express how honored we are to have Mr. Yoder and Dr. Levy uh, on the live stream, um, as well as how thrilled we are to have uh, been privileged with the great Utana Heck having joined us at Daily Cloud a couple of months ago, and she's doing absolutely some of the best investigative journalism around. So this is an issue that affects absolutely everyone. As I tweeted before we began, will I ever fly again? But we're going to find out exactly what's at stake here with them, with these mRNA uh, injections and uh, the Freedom Flyers and um, the issues that Aitana, Mr. Yoder, and Dr. Levy have uncovered. Over to you all. Thank you so much, Dr. Wolf. Um, Josh, maybe you could just give us a little bit of background and give us a couple of events that happened that led up to some recent discoveries that you've made in aviation with, it, with the FAA. Sure. I think I think most people um, by now are probably familiar with U.S. Freedom Flyers. You know, we were originally formed um, to stand for individual rights and freedoms, you know, when the mandates, right before the mandates came down, actually. Um, the issues that we're facing have really transitioned over the past year. Uh, we're seeing incredible numbers of vaccine injury among pilots, um, many cardiac issues, also neurological dysfunction, uh, among other things. And this is how Dr. Levy came onto the scene. I reached out to him. Uh, we found some very disturbing information, actually, in, in FAA documentation. In October of 2022, they changed the cardiac uh, testing standards for pilots. And uh, I'll let him talk about that. Essentially, what it was was an increase in PR interval. Um, it was one of, our, one of the people on our research team, actually, the guy that heads it up, Mike Rollick. He's also a major airline pilot. And um, he discovered this information. He sent it over to me and said, hey, what do you think about this? Is there any medical significance? Well, the story we're talking about today started when we, uh, Mike actually emailed Dr. Levy um, and asked that very question. And um, the response that we got was incredibly troubling. And I, I would like Dr. Levy to speak to that. I think, um, you know, what we're facing right now, there's so many people, so many pilots out here flying with cardiac issues that are currently undiagnosed. And because of the relaxation of standards, um, it, it's, it's putting these pilots and, and the public at risk. Um, let me jump in, if I may, Mr. Yoder, and uh, just just clarify or be sure I understand before Dr. Levy responds. Um, are you saying that there is a, a benchmark or a standard for cardiac fitness that pilots have to meet before they're allowed to fly by commercial aviation and that these standards were relaxed in 2022? Is that the gist of what, what you're sharing? That's exactly what I'm saying. Yes. So pilots actually don't receive any cardiac testing until the age of 35 years old. And which when you get your annual flight physical, you get an EKG. Um, an, EKG an EKG is not a comprehensive test. It's not something that detects, you know, some of the largest issues that we're saying, things like myocarditis, subclinical myocarditis has zero symptoms. Um, and we also know that myocarditis has a 20% mortality rate within two years, 50% within five years. And you don't have symptoms. So what I'm saying is that the FAA is not looking for this problem. And because we're not looking for it, we're not finding it. And if we don't find it, the very first symptom can be sudden death. That's why we're so concerned. And then when they lowered the um, they, they lowered the standard, you know, for for the, the interval back in October of 2022, we had to ask the question why they only published that there was a change, not why they made the change. There's no science attached to it. It's just something that they arbitrarily did. So that's what that's the question that we're asking now. You know, maybe maybe we're wrong. We hope we are. Uh, and, we hope that they can actually publish data that would that would validate the change. But so far, they don't they don't want to speak to us. About and, it. and again, sorry to keep you from answering for just 30 seconds more, Dr. Levy. But um, what exactly was the change that they made? They that I don't understand exactly kind of how, how much worse your your cardiac health can. So, be. so yeah. You know, I mean, the, the change was very simple. So the, the normal PR interval um, yeah. and, and has been for years has been. 0.12 to 0.2. What's and what the PR, FAA? Sorry, what's a PR interval? Forgive my ignorance. 
I will, I will let Dr. Levy uh, speak to that. He's, he's the cardiologist here. Um, essentially what they did is they stated that, you know, a pilot can now have above a 0.2 PR interval. And as long as he has no symptoms, he can be cleared to go fly without any additional cardiac testing. This is the really significant portion of this change. Oh, wow. um, typically, if someone had an extended PR interval, which is, um, you know, uh, which is essentially the, the, the cycle, the electrical cycle of the heart, which Dr. Levy will speak to, um, you would then have to go in for additional testing. This doesn't wow. mean you're going to drop dead tomorrow, but it means we need to investigate it. Wow. So now what they're saying is that the pilot can be signed off for flight clearance with a first class flight physical without any additional um, uh, testing, as long as the pilot has no symptoms. But when you dig into the liter literature, um, it states very clearly that most people with an elongated PR interval have no symptoms. So you can understand why this is so concerning. Okay, I understand now. Thank you so much, Mr. Yoder. Um, Dr. Levy, please, I, I'd love to understand more from your point of view. Well, actually, it's very interesting. When Josh first uh, met me and we talked, and then I later interacted with Mike Rollick, who did the research Josh talked about, I probably, like nearly all the other cardiologists and internists, really didn't pay much attention to PR intervals since they do commonly appear a little prolonged. The PR interval is the natural amount of time that should take place where the first impulse generated at the top of the atrium goes through the atrium and makes its way to the middle of the heart where it then gets disseminated rapidly to cause a heartbeat in synchrony. And that is a certain amount of time. It shouldn't be too short, it shouldn't be too long, but in many young people, it's long, usually athletic, physical, but in most adults, it's not prolonged. Mm -hmm. And when it does start to prolong, after it's been normal your entire life, it does raise a little bit of a red flag. Mm -hmm. Now, what really raised my interest and then got me into researching this issue and then writing the article that I have that's pretty heavily referenced mm -hmm. is that when Mike Rollick showed me these changes the FAA made, the first thing is, why on earth, out of the blue, did they change a normal interval that's been present since the history of the electrocardiogram began and right. decided to increase that interval by 100%? Right. Just arbitrary across the board. 100%? 100%. Wow. Yes. Yeah, so it went from 0.2 to 0.3, wow. which... When you're looking at a cardiogram, that's a big, that's a big spot. That's a big space. And so it raised the logical question and the logical conclusion is that the only reason the FAA would do anything like this mm -hmm. is they're obviously seeing large numbers or significant numbers of prolonged PR intervals in pilots or prospective pilots that they've never seen before. Mm -hmm. And rather than be burdened, shall I say, with evaluating pilots further, they just decided to extend that normal range and say, okay, you're up, wow. you're up to here now, you're okay. Wow, okay, I understand and talking. The shocking thing about this is, and this is what I found after doing my due diligence, is they have articles in the literature that are studied, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. This came out in JAMA in 2009, Journal of the American Medical Association. At Harvard, they did a study that extended over 30 years with thousands of patients, individuals, I should say, in the Framingham study in, in Massachusetts, Framingham population. Mm -hmm. And they found that when your PR interval was just, just above 0.2, not all the way to 0.3, but just above 0.2 or more, over that period of time, you had twice the chance of atrial fibrillation three times the chance of a high enough degree of heart block to require a pacemaker and a 50% chance increase of death from all causes. Mm. So this is not an innocuous change. Mm. The thing is that really makes this of concern to take it a step further is we're just not talking about a group of people who had a PR interval of X and it's gradually increasing now as you age, because everything ages when you age, including the conduction system of your heart. Mm -hmm. But it shows that something in the pandemic has suddenly caused PR intervals to skyrocket. Mm -hmm. And the only answer to that, in my humble opinion as a cardiologist, is at the very least you're having a low grade level of myocarditis or inflammation oh my gosh. In, in the cells that conduct 
these impulses and to just gloss over it. I mean, they actually have people saying, well, the FAA made this safer by increasing this interval. Oh, my goodness. It's kind of like, don't believe what you're looking at. Believe what right. I'm telling you. Right, it's right. completely outrageous. And, of course, to add to the final upsetting picture of it all is you have heart cells that run on electricity, if you will. And when you inflame them, they become electrically unstable. So when you have the setting of something like this, already some induced COVID-related or vaccine-related disease in the conduction system, and then you add a stress situation, adrenaline, I think pilots undergo a bit of adrenaline every now and then, sure. you can immediately go into a either fatal or non-fatal arrhythmia. It just oh depends on, on where you fall. Okay, so this is not acceptable in the slightest degree, and I might finally add before we perhaps expand our discussion is as a frequent flyer for many years and a cardiologist, I stupidly thought that they did not inconsequential, but extensive cardiac evaluations on pilots, because guess what? Mm -hmm. The 50, 55 year old male pilot, which is still the most common, mm -hmm. the way that he dies most commonly is by a heart attack. OK, and you don't you cannot tell if somebody is subject to getting a heart attack with an EKG that just tells you, did you have a heart attack before or not? It doesn't tell you whether you're going to get a heart attack in the next 10 minutes until you do at least cardiac stress test evaluation to see how well your heart tolerates on the EKG increases in blood pressure and increases in heart rate. So to me, it exposed a number of things it exposed to me the fact that they're not doing a doggone thing right now to have any reasonable assurance <sighs> of, of a cardiac, of, of a healthy heart, and not looking, glossing over these changes, and then finally, the troponin level and the D-dimer level. The Takes troponin cool. level goes up when there's any damage at all. Right. It's not going to go up to the range where you have classical myocarditis. That's a really high elevation, but it should not be out of the normal range. Right. And your D-dimer, which is blood clotting, should not be out of the normal range. And right. when people say, what causes this? I think the most straightforward answer is persistent spike protein. And right now, we know you get that from two sources. You sometimes hang on to the spike protein with long-haul chronic COVID, right. and you're getting spike protein pretty much via the mRNA directly injected to you with each vaccine. Right. So both scenarios, I, I can't sit here and tell you which one's the most, but I can tell you they both cause it. And to say the vaccine is innocent in all this is just really not acknowledging scientific reality. Right. I understand. Eitana, hey, is it okay if I ask a couple of follow-up questions? Please, please okay. do. Thank you. Oh, I mean, this is so shocking and stunning and important. Well, I guess I've got three immediate questions. One is it would seem to me that the FAA had been seeing or anticipating a widespread enough um, instance or evidence of, of these abnormalities in the heartbeats of their, you know, kind of general population of pilots, mm -hmm. that that would be the reason they made the change, right? I mean, if you only That's have right. one person out of 10,000 who has this abnormality, you're not going to make a change because you can say to that person, okay, I'm sorry, you can't fly. Is that correct? That's correct. That, I, I that can't think of any other explanation for them to out of the blue, pick right. this one part of the EKG test and say, we're going to move the goalpost back. Right. We're going to change the rules of the game. So this is my next follow-up question to that. And, and forgive me from going right from medical to kind of social cultural, but that's, that's no my, my background. Um, I'm not a medical doctor, but oh my goodness, I, I, I see some implications here socially and culturally and, and economically. So, so presumably if they didn't make the change, right? If they hadn't changed the goalposts, there would be a risk that a lot of pilots who are needed to fly would not be allowed to fly. Is that a reasonable assumption? Yes, but not necessarily permanently, because if you do the right evaluation, and if, for example, you see elevation of the troponin and or the D-dimer, we have 
treatments that can bring those back to normal. So it's not necessarily condemning a pilot to never right. being able to fly again if he's uh, up to 0.3 in his PR interval. It just means he or she needs to undergo further evaluation. But absolutely, absolutely, nobody with a troponin elevation and a D-dimer elevation should be inside the cockpit. Let me um, ask that question a somewhat different way. All right. um, airlines stay in business by not grounding dozens and dozens of planes sure. every day. So, so I'm just thinking kind of reasoning backwards, which is my training as a, a reporter. If the airline didn't make, if the airlines, if the FAA, I should say, didn't make this change, there would be a risk that a lot of pilots would be needed to be taken out of active service, evaluated more carefully. Some of those would be identified as not safe to fly. Others would be put back in rotation, but there would be a risk of leaking a story that several dozen or several hundred pilots are being evaluated further for heart damage. Is that a reasonable assumption? I know it's not your job to answer that as a medical doctor, but- No, no. I mean, this undoubtedly will ultimately result in probably- a significant number, I can't tell you how many, of pilots not being able to fly again, pretty much regardless. Right. But my goodness, you see, when you have these parameters in the general population, this is sort of obvious, but I want to point it out. We have different relaxed standards because the person is only putting their only their own life at risk. Okay. Right. So, but right. you you can't you can't you, you're, I mean. Uh, you can tell us, Josh, the average pilot, I don't know, flies how many flights a, a, a day or a week or something like that. So you probably have responsibility for 2,000 lives a week. I'm just pulling a number out of, the, out of the thin air. But so there has to be a greater evaluation. And we have the tools. So I can only imagine that the FAA needs to grow a conscience and needs to grow a spine. Okay, we need to just stop making excuses and protect the public. And let me tell you, as a very simple, simple, simple point of view, I, as a frequent flyer, I'm not going to say I don't, I'm not going to fly anymore, but I'm not going to fly nearly as much until I know things are being taken care of, but only because they have two pilots in each plane. And mm -hmm. recently, the airlines started pressuring the FAA, God knows why, uh -huh say, probably pilot shortage that they cause with the vaccination and pay, pilot retirements, right. they're, they're lobbying the FDA to have some flights with one pilot. My <gasps> goodness, I would never come close to that plane. Oh my gosh, I, I quite agree. I'm going to try to ask this question a third time in a different way, if you'll be patient with me. Okay. If the change hadn't been made, the FAA would have had difficulty or, or airlines would have had difficulty with staffing short-term or long-term. Is that a, a reasonable assumption? No, not necessarily. They would have just needed to do more evaluation. Gotcha. All right. Basically I what they did by, by changing, by moving at the goalposts was mm -hmm. taking the burden off of them to do more testing. You'll still have ultimately the same number of pilots that should be disqualified or shouldn't be disqualified, right. no matter where you start with the PR interval, if you right. do proper evaluation. Well, I guess where I'm going with this is we've seen so many instances it, from other agencies of choosing not to look in order not to see something. And right. I'm wondering if this is an instance of the FAA choosing not to look essentially in a way that's responsible so that they don't find a potential problem with the hearts of a lot of pilots or the blood. Of I think of they're people. choosing not to look. They're choosing not to evaluate out of financial and other stresses. And I think, quite honestly, they weren't counting on people like Mike Rollock to pour mm -hmm. through their regulations and suddenly see, my goodness, they changed the rules on evaluation of the heart. I don't think they expected anybody to find that, quite honestly. I understand. All right. Thank you so much. You've answered my, my, my main questions. Can I go back to Mr. Yoda for a minute? Sure. Uh, and Etana, am I, am I following your, your plan here? All right. So, so this is horrifying. Um, so Mr. Yoder, as a pilot, what realistically are some, and I know this is, you know, an outlier worst case scenario, but 
what are the reasons, what are the risks both to pilots and to crew and to passengers of a situation like the one that Dr. Luby and you have described? What could well, happen? It's, it's, it's incredible, Naomi. So let, let's start here. Let's start back at December 15th of 2021 when U.S. Freedom Flyers put together a team of professionals, including cardiologists, lawyers, uh, flight surgeons, that wrote a letter to the FAA. It was a 10-page letter that was introduced um, with with uh, medical support behind it. We had, you know, um, incidents of, of vaccine injured pilots in that letter. People who, including one Cody Flint, who actually passed out while he was flying after both of his inner ears ruptured. Oh, wow. um, he lost all equilibrium. He was alone in an aircraft, a very yeah. large um, aerial. Um, he, he was an aerial applicator, you know, crop duster, flying a large aircraft, single pilot. Um, he doesn't remember landing the aircraft. He thought for sure that he he was a dead man. Um, so that was one of the most that was one of the most um, uh, horrifying stories that came out early on that actually happened to him in February of 2021. So the point that I'm making is the FAA can't say that we didn't warn them. They can't say that they didn't know. We sent that letter via courier, uh, via other means. We know they got it. We know for sure they got it, uh, but they never followed up with us. Um, interestingly enough, about two months later, um, Director Dixon, he was the, F, the, the director of the FAA. He resigned hmm. now that that um, that FAA director has not been replaced. And now just um, as recently as, as yesterday, um, Steve Kirsch and U.S. Freedom Flyers have been asking the questions. We've been saying, look, we, we just want you to tell us the reason for the change. Um, show us the data. Show us why what you're doing is the safest course of action. If you can prove that you know, to us, then, then we're OK. We, we have no further questions. But unfortunately, rather than answering the questions, um, they're on the run. Anyone who wants to learn more about this uh, should follow Steve Kirsch on Substack. Um, it's incredible. There was um, a Substack that came out last night, actually two last night, I think one this morning, and another one that's going to be published today. And now the, um, the the federal flight surgeon for the FAA is in the hot seat. She has um, she's the top doctor of the FAA, and she has uh, she's answered these questions. Yeah. And you know, to this point, she has not been willing to do so. So it's going to be interesting to see where this goes. What I can tell you is, if we do nothing about this. We're going to see more incidents like Captain Bob Snow, who he was flying American Airlines 1067 from Denver to Dallas, Fort Worth on April 9th of 2022. He landed that aircraft. They pulled into the gate six minutes after those wheels touched down. Uh, Captain Snow stood up to collect his bags to leave the flight, and he collapsed in cardiac arrest. Oh uh, very, very fortunately for him, uh, there was a nurse and a Navy corpsman on board that aircraft. They were deplaning. They pulled him out of the aircraft, performed CPR. They hooked him up to an AED, had to shock him three times to bring him back to life. Oh and from April 9th until now, you, know, you have to remember, this was 15 minutes from American Airlines headquarters and also the headquarters of the union, the Allied Pilots Association. Right. Do you think any of them like contacted him or, or check up on him to see if he's OK? No. He oh. woke up in the ICU 24 hours after that and um, he called U.S. Freedom Flyers and we flew down with the team. We brought in doctors, we brought in lawyers and, and other people to come make sure that Captain Snow was OK. Oh. And I just spoke with him yesterday and he said he still had no contact. You know, he's been placed on long term disability. Um, his career has been destroyed. And then we have uh, Captain Greg Pearson, another good friend of mine that I spoke with this morning. You know, within hours of getting his first Pfizer shot, he went to atrial fibrillation. And, um, you know, he actually he actually texted Susan Northrop this morning. I, I saw the text message uh, because she had made a statement to Steve Kirsch that no pilots have been have been harmed or incapacitated by these vaccines. And my phone has been ringing off the hook all morning this morning from very angry um, vaccine injured pilots who've lost their careers. Mm. And, and many of them have nearly lost their lives. And for, for the head doctor of the FAA to come out and make a statement like that, uh, that's it's completely unacceptable. And we're going to say we're going to continue to apply the pressure until something's done about this. And her husband is a pilot who is unvaccinated. Oh, wow. Yes. He's Dr. Northrop's husband. I believe I have that correct. Uh, wow. I was reading some of the same articles that Josh was talking about uh, when she was being interviewed by Steve Kirsch. OK, mm -hmm. uh, it turns out, at least it's stated in the article, that she had a pilot husband who was unvaccinated because he chose not to. But it makes you wonder. I got to say this, in case it's just not completely obvious or in case nobody to say it out loud. All of this is occurring because of the science of vaccinology, the religion of vaccinology that we now have in this country, where you can't even point out clear cut scientific evidence of too much harm. Right. There's never been a doubt, should never be a doubt, that vaccines always cause some harm, some degree of the time. But I think we've way crossed past the threshold of how much should be tolerated for the benefits that are being given. Okay, right. we have many different ways to cure COVID. 
There's absolutely no need to ever vaccinate for it again. But sound logic doesn't win the day. But this is this is why you're still going to see resistance to this. I mean, the uh, the FAA flight surgeon. She avoided those questions because there is no answer to are, how can you take a normal range and make it more abnormal and say it's in the benefit of the of the health of the public? You can't. No, no there's no way. Uh, may I go back to uh, ask a follow-up question of Mr. Yoder, please? Oh, please, and, please. And, and no, Dr. Levy, I, I, I absolutely appreciate what, what you're saying. And I, I must say, you know, as someone who's um, overseen the reports produced by these 3,500 medical and scientific experts going through the Pfizer documents, we've seen cardiac damage at industrial scale and neurological problems at industrial scale. And, and, and what I should also tell Mr. Yoder, because I think it's helpful to his case, is that the SEC filing for BioNTech, which makes the Pfizer vaccine, discloses to the SEC, but not to the American public, that collapsing so hard you might hurt yourself as a side effect of the injection. Um, I just wanted to let you know that. That's something that uh, the SEC knew in 2021, but no agency disclosed to this day to the American people. Um, let me go back to the act of flying. And part of the reason I'm so kind of granular about this and so terrified at what you're telling me is I, um, I, 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 my partner was a private pilot for six years, um, or my partner for six years was a private pilot. And oh, so when you mention adrenaline in the heart, I mean, just flying in small planes, you know, there are so many situations normally that cause surges of adrenaline. There's like flying can be challenging in the best of times in perfect health. So, so again, to Mr. Yoder, um, what are some instances, what are some like, just take us into a, an aircraft, all right, whether it's commercial or private, what are some, some things that could happen if God forbid, you know, Mr. Snow had sustained a cardiac arrest in flight or if a flight attendant um, has heart damage or faints or collapses, you know, in flight or, um, or you know, what, what are some of the risks that we're really looking at? I mean, some people might say, well, there are two pilots, you know, this is horrible, but I'm going to be safe ultimately because, you know, even if one <laughs> dies, the other will keep flying the plane. What are some things that can actually happen um, that are risky in this scenario? So I want to draw attention to something called critical phases of flight. That's, you know, low to the ground on takeoff and low to the ground on landing. So let's say, let's use Captain, uh, Captain Snow's scenario. Let's say that he had went into cardiac arrest six minutes prior and he's the flying, you know, he's the flying pilot and um, they're, they're at a hundred feet above the runway on landing. You know, if, if Captain Snow just collapses in his seat, you know, he's wearing shoulder harnesses, so he's not going to slump forward. You know, he's being held in place by, by, you know, um, you know, by seat belts. And the other pilot doesn't notice right away that he's becoming incapacitated. Oh my God. And so you have a you have a recognition period right during a critical phase of flight when, you know, at 100 feet, you're going to start flaring around you know 30 to 50 feet. And that aircraft continues on that downward trajectory. And by the time the other pilot realizes, maybe he realizes when that aircraft doesn't flare, you know, to, to create a smooth landing. Mm -hmm. That's the type of thing that we're worried about. Um, the other issues are the brain fog that we're seeing. So many pilots are reporting to me that they're having brain fog. So imagine, if you will, we're rolling down the runway at 80 knots oh. and 80, 100 knots, and there's an engine failure. And there's a there's a two-crew procedure, right, in order to, to secure that engine, fly the aircraft, and bring it back around. Um, there again, you know, if that happens, let's say it happens right at rotation, and these guys have brain fog. I, I have friends, actually, who tell me that for five minutes at a time, they, they, they can't um, – they, they, they almost can't understand what they're doing, um, including one oh who sat in the God. flight deck. And he said he had to get out and go walk around the airplane to like clear his head. And this is oh something that happens on a, on a, on a fairly frequent basis. And we know this is another side effect of the vaccine. Oh. So there again, if, if, if this happens at cruise, not a big deal. It's absolutely correct. You have a second pilot and you can have a safe conclusion to the flight. One pilot can fly the airplane. It's when it happens at the most inopportune moment. And we're look we're playing with the law of averages here, right. you know, with the thousands of flights that go per day, you know, you multiply that by several years and eventually, you know, eventually lightning strikes. Yeah. And that's what we're concerned about. And that's why we're so adamant that, that we need to look into this. All we're, we're looking for answers. We have the solutions. I think Dr. Levy will speak to this. Uh, we have solutions to help these people, but we can't help people that don't know they don't, that they have a problem. Well, we can't oh, help yeah. people that won't be properly diagnosed and manages. I mean, the pilot's not going to evaluate him or herself. Right. Someone in charge dictating a protocol of evaluation. 
after yeah. that's been done and we detect the abnormalities, then obviously we can treat them effectively. I want to hear more about um, solutions, Dr. Levy, before I go back to you. Sure. I just want to say, Mr. Yoder, when you were talking about, you know, a pilot being potentially unconscious, it, I mean, this is the stuff of horror films, right? Um, but now it's our reality. A pilot in, in, in harnesses, he's not slumping forward or she's not slumping forward. I just want to note that it's my understanding that um, at least commercial flight has gotten so uh, computerized that sometimes the other pilot will will be asleep, you know, and that's legitimate. Like it's it's understood that, you know, one pilot has the, you know, is on task and the other is is sleeping, especially on long international flights. What, just, could just, just, a, just a correction there. Just just a correction there. I mean, no, the other pilot's not sleeping on, on long international flights. Uh, certain ones, you know, the ones that, you know, you know, trips to Europe and things like that, there'll be three pilots, sometimes even four pilots, depending on the length of the flight. So pilots will rotate out, you know, to sleep. But as far as the two pilots in the flight deck, um, they're, they're both required to be awake. Okay, thank you. So, so let me ask it in a more informed way. And thank you so much for that correction. Um, presumably, the, the, this, there has to be a whole new culture between pilots, right? Of, a lot more awareness, a lot more scrutiny in a, in a way that might not be best for actually managing the plane, managing weather, managing birds, managing, you know, emergencies. Um, if you can't be sure that the person next to you is alert and functioning properly, is that a fair thing to say? It's it's fair to say. And, and this is why the FAA needs to make this an issue. You know, there's so many pilots that, that aren't aware of, of the, the incidents that have happened. And so the, the first thing I think is to educate people and help them to understand why it's important that they get screened. And then we need to provide the screening. Uh, but most importantly, you have to understand these people were coerced and threatened into getting, right. into getting these shots through the mandates. Um, so there has to be absolute amnesty for the pilot. The airlines, you know, the FAA uh, failed as a regulator. They then allowed, you know, these medications to be given to pilots. The, the companies mandated them and then the unions um, actually supported the companies and the government, not the pilots. So the amnesty needs to be given to the pilots where if something happens or they go out on medical, they're not just placed on long-term disability. The company needs to pay for their health care and they need to pay them a full salary. Absolutely. Tell me before I, sorry, Dr. Levy. I'm enjoying myself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What, you know, why did that happen? I mean, why would a giant industry, a multi-billion dollar a year industry with so much at stake, take the dumb risk of, you know, as well as the unethical risk, but leaving that aside, just the stupid risk of injecting a not thoroughly tested substance by mandate into the bodies of their entire highly trained personnel. Why and why would the unions have supported that? What's your best guess about that, Mr. Yoder? I think it's quite simple. Look at um, look at who some of the shareholders are. I mean, look at the investments of BlackRock, who we know are, you know, in bed with the U.S. government. And in addition to that, look at the the many airline bailouts that have happened over the years when airlines go bankrupt. If those airlines had stood up to the federal government, um, they would certainly be at risk at losing you know future funding, right. especially at a time we were coming you know coming through COVID when they had lost you know wow. hundreds of millions, billions of dollars actually, and the federal government was um, supporting them through CARES funds and, and uh, different programs. You know, any resistance to the federal government could have been financially significant for those airlines. That, that makes a lot of sense. So really, lockdowns held kind of a metaphorical gun to the head of the airlines, the, the private airlines as, you know, as well, like, okay, you can have your business back if you do what the federal government is mandating, if you force this on your employees. Is that a fair thing to say? I think, I think that's fair to say that that's what I truly believe has happened. Yeah. And unfortunately, you know, they, they should have given pushback. They should have demanded, the airlines actually should, should have demanded of the FAA that they do proper studies. Right on these substances before they were injected into pilots. That's th this would have stopped um, the, the entire program had the airlines pushed back and said, okay, that's fine. Uh, we'll, we'll do it, but we need to see the safety studies of which the FAA did zero. Unbelievable. Sorry. I'm sorry, isn't a part of this also that the FAA uh, violated their own guidelines because it's been, you know, it's, it's always been a rule that you can't, uh, you can't even allow a pilot to take a drug until it's been on the market for a year fully approved. Which it was nowhere near that when they started, uh, when they started the mandates. That, that's right, Atana. In the Aeromedical Examiner's Guide, it states very clearly that a pilot should not uh, be given a medication until 12 months post full FDA approval. And the reason for that guidance is to determine if there are any significant uh, side effects that could affect the safety of flight. 
So there we have them violating their own guidance. Right. And, um, and, and now we're paying the price for that. You know, I, people need to understand a pilot can't, ta- can't even take a benign medication like NyQuil today and go fly tomorrow or a Zyrtec. I can't take a Zyrtec for allergies and go fly uh, because of the drowsiness component. Right. You know, so the side effects, however, the side effects of these vaccines, which we knew all, all the way back in mm-hmm. December of 21, when that letter uh, w- was sent to the FAA, was oh. it was causing, you know, blood clots, strokes, heart attacks, neurological dysfunction. So drowsiness is a problem, but all the, the other um, issues that I mentioned uh, seem to be okay with the FAA. Yeah. And and while you're speaking, I'm also thinking of, um, and that was a great question, Aitana. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of, of female pilots and female um uh, staff, you know, uh, flight attendants and, and, and people who assist flight attendants um, on the flight. There's so much stability. Um, I mean, they're, they're, they're hemorrhaging, they're having excruciating cramps. They're, they have, you know, horrible illnesses in addition to the cardiac illnesses that we're talking about in terms of just their, their, their cycles. Um, I, I cannot, believe that that helps in if god forbid there's an emergency landing or god forbid they have to think quickly in in a crisis um and i'm not trying to kind of single out you know women as more debilitated than the men everyone has been debilitated by these injections i'm just like thinking out loud um you know of all the horrible damage to to kind of women's bodies you know women are key parts of the flight staff and many many important roles and and that can't be helping um, dr levy let's go to what you wanted to say what 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 help can there be i mean to my knowledge there is no treatment yet that's more than anecdotal for these these spike proteins and these lipid nanoparticles the, and the cardiac damage and the para, you know myocarditis pericarditis what what is what is it that people can do? What is it people can do who are listening? Um, what can loved ones of pilots and flight staff do? What, what do you recommend? Well, for people who are listening, because the whole public should be concerned about what damage they might have done to their body with a vaccine or what they might still be going on inside their body with chronic COVID. As best we know right now, it's persistent spike protein from the COVID virus. So for the general public, really the best thing you can do is start optimizing your vitamin C intake uh, and add some other things like methylene blue, which is a strong antioxidant like vitamin C. And finally, and I'm giving you a very simple, I mean, there are dozens of different things you could do for this. I want to give you something that's simple that people don't have to go crazy looking into all the detail. The other two things are natokinase and bromelain, which is an enzyme from the pineapple. Both of these have been shown, taken orally, they get into your bloodstream and they actually dissolve the spike protein. So you take the vitamin C and these other things, other antioxidants like vitamin C, which help repair the damage that was done to the tissue because all damage is oxidative in nature. And these are antioxidants. And the other thing is eliminating spike protein. And this is done with proper enzyme therapy. And this is all tracked by getting the troponin test and the D-dimer test. As we alluded to earlier, I think everybody should get these tests because it's great if they're normal. And if they are normal, then you're better equipped to deal with some problem in the future where you might not know what's going on and you go back and recheck these tests. The important thing to remember about the troponin level, though, is although it directly indicates myocardial inflammation, it's also a marker test. The other areas of the body, the nervous system, the GI, the pancreas, the ovaries, everything, they don't have marker tests. Mm -hmm. So when you have an elevated troponin, in all likelihood, you have problems elsewhere in the body due to the persistence of that spike protein that's causing the problem in the heart. Like Mm -hmm. Josh alluded to in some detail, Mm -hmm. Wow, I'm not exactly sure what form it would take, but uh, pilots, I think, should probably get at least some reasonably good neurological evaluation after all these things are returned to normal glab-wise to make sure there's not any permanent problem, permanent damage with the brain, since the brain and the neurological system are much more difficult to recover completely from an affliction, as is another organ. So, so those are the basics. High dose vitamin C, uh, if you're in the care of a physician, taking hydrocortisone with it pushes the vitamin C inside the cell. One other thing that people can do, because many people have 
persistence of the COVID pathogen in their body is when you nebulize with hydrogen peroxide, you clean out areas in the upper pharyngeal area where the COVID virus continues to grow, but you're not aware of it. So you knock that out, and then the body's immune system, along with the vitamin C, and along with the dissolving enzymes that I mentioned, you can have an overall protocol, very simple, that will knock out the, sp the spike protein reliably. Well, thank you. Just to note that we're not medical doctors, Etana and I. So um, just, I, I hear you. And I just have to say legally, I, I, can't, I can neither endorse nor no. not endorse. I just, I, I hear you. And uh, have you had, are there any clinical trials you've done? Any uh, peer reviewed uh, publications um, with this protocol that you can share, Dr. Levy? Or is this an- No, it, we don't have any, we don't have any studies on it though. I okay, mean, there are well, many things that each of these things have done independently that are documented in the literature, and then you put them all together for a scenario like this. But, yeah. you know, you're not going to see studies like this until there's an acknowledgement right. in the medical community that there's a persistence of the spike protein in the body. And what are we going to do to get it out? So if you can't get past the, the first step of acknowledging that it's there, you're not right. going to see studies that are going to realistically look at what protocol A, B, or C does. Absolutely. Um, well, let's turn now in our last few moments together to what, you know, what we can do to help the pilots, what we can do to make the FAA behave more responsibly. And, and lastly, what decisions should we make about flying? And, and one question I do have before you answer that, um, Dr. Levy, this one's for you, is I know the spiked protein worries a lot of doctors and it should, but in addition, what gives me nightmares is lipid nanoparticles because of the websites for lipid nanoparticles that I've read that where it's literally an industrial fat um, that is shipped out to kind of anyone. It, you know, it's, and, and, and it changes its properties based on uh, temperature. And this is something that haunts me because it solidifies at room temperature and at body temperature. And this is something I think has not been um, addressed thoroughly enough. But where I'm going with that is, you know, these, this clotting in the blood, the blood clots, and we've, again, in the Pfizer documents, there's so much blood clotting. Um, could that affect cognition in a pilot, uh, the, the, the thickening of blood or the clotting of blood, in addition no, to cardiac issues? No question. I think that's the primary issue. And that's what you track with the D-dimer test. The D-dimer test looks at evidence that excessive blood clots are being dissolved. Oh, I okay? see. So, so as long as you have excessive blood clots being formed, your natural coagulant mechanism tries to dissolve those blood clots and that releases substances that keep the D-dimer elevated. So as long as that D-dimer is elevated, uh, although there are other diseases where it can be found for the most part in the general population, if you have an elevated D-dimer, you have a serious ongoing blood clotting problem which in the context of the pandemic mm -hmm. almost always means a persistent spike protein from either the vaccine or never having got rid of COVID to begin with. Gotcha. Oh, and so Mr. Yoder, do pilots tell you they're not feeling well generally? I mean, even overall, apart from the ones who've already been identified as vaccine damaged or identified themselves that way. No, oh, we've actually been very, we've actually been very careful um, in the past. I mean, if you're not feeling well, you shouldn't be flying. That's why you have sick days. Yeah. And and I know of, you know, just to give you an example. So at American Airlines between January and July of 2022, the, the pilots union reported that there was a 300% increase in disability claims. What that tells me is that pilots are obviously not feeling well and they're seeking medical attention and, um, you know, which is the increase in those claims. And then you see the obvious, obvious uh, staffing issues that are occurring. It's not just due to the vaccine or COVID. There's other factors in there as well, but it's certainly exacerbated by this problem. Uh, but then I also know of cases where pilots are having issues and they're not being treated uh, because they're afraid of losing that flight medical and losing their careers. And to any pilot who's listening, who is having problems, I would ask them to please contact us at medical at usfreedomflyers.org. Um, you will remain anonymous, uh, but we'll get you help. You know, I mean, that that's really all we care about is getting these people help. Sure. Um, we, we, we don't want to ruin anyone's careers. That's not the goal of this. The goal is to actually save their lives and save their careers. Absolutely. So this leads to, uh, to my last, um, you know, earlier few questions. How can we listen who are not pilots, help pilots in general, help, you know, aviation staffers in general, they, we rely on them so much. They're so brave. 
um, what can we do to help? Well, what we've seen is that the FAA, it does not appear that the FAA is going to be proactive on this issue. Um, we, we've tried, we've asked the questions, we've provided the solutions, and unfortunately time is running out on this. And so we believe the only way forward is litigation to actually force the issue and to force the amnesty for these pilots. And litigation obviously is very expensive. Um, so if, if this is, is something that concerns you, we would ask that you go to usfreedomflyers.org and, and please donate there and help us to bring the litigation against the FAA that's going to bring a stop to this. Uh, we're, we have to force their hand at this point. If they're not going to do something about it, we're, we're going to help them. Understood. Everyone um, who's listening, please do uh, help in that way. And also, why why are the unions not taking the lead in this? Isn't that their job, Josh? It is their job. And what's really interesting is um, during COVID and during, you know, in the, during the vaccine rollout, uh, the unions were very totalitarian. Uh, there's actually been elections since then, and you've seen a tremendous amount of backlash. And we now have, have elected uh, many pro, uh, pro-medical freedom uh, people into key positions, inclu- mm-hmm. including like president and uh, aeromedical committee positions mm-hmm. um, who are now pushing back. And they're pointing out that what the um, that what the airlines did was a direct violation of Title 21 law. They, they violated longstanding U.S. code. Mm-hmm. Uh, what they did is illegal and they can be sued for it. And uh, the, the conversation is certainly shifting. And I think that, um, you know, many people within airline management and including the the union personnel who push this, uh, there, there seems to be some concern now. Well, that's progress. Um, and lastly, you know, those of us who fly, how do we know, is there anything we can do to choose a, a less lethal rather than more lethal airline? Um, any way, any warning signs we should look for if we're boarding a plane? Like what, what can we do to keep a little bit safe for ourselves? Well, I think what you can do is you can always ask questions. You know, you, when you see the pilots in the airports or, or you're boarding the aircraft, you can always ask to speak to them. And you know, it's, it's, it's valuable for you to ask those pilots if they've been vaccinated and if they say they have, make them aware of these issues. There's still many people that, that either aren't aware or aren't admitting uh, that these issues are occurring. And I think it's going to be the public pressure uh, that's really going to make a difference here. You know, this fight was started by airline pilots and airline personnel, but it's going to be finished by the passengers. Absolutely. Um, well spoken. Dr. Levy, is there anything else you want to share with our audience um, before we sadly have to wrap up? Well, along the lines of what Josh just said there is everybody can't wait for everybody else to do something. There has to be a collective anger, a collective demand for the right thing being done. I mentioned earlier, I couldn't believe how little was done before all this happened in the pandemic to evaluate Mm -hmm. the cardiac status of a pilot. I think that should be changed too. I think in addition to everything else, At the very least, we should demand a cardiac stress test even after the troponin and the D-dimer levels are normal. So, no, we need need the public. I mean, sounds like a commercial. Talk to your politicians. Make them aware of it. Uh, We we need to get the word out. We need to embarrass. We need to humiliate the FAA. Right. (laughs) And and is there some model legislation that you want to have passed as well? Or is there a good bill to protect pilots into the future. That's something we at Daily Cloud should create for you, Mr. Yoder, um, and for the pilots community, or does that exist already? I would, I would love to see Daily Cloud take the lead on this. You know, that's, that's important. It absolutely needs to be done. Uh, we need to attack this issue from every angle. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm primarily focused right now on finding the solutions, identifying the problem, finding the solutions, uh, making sure that we're addressing this immediate safety signal. And once we get beyond that, you know, obviously, I, I think there, there's plenty of work to go around and there's a lot to be done. And it's going to take organizations with um, with different expertise coming together uh, to really put together a comprehensive package to win this fight. And Josh, is this an international problem, not just a domestic? I mean, presumably pilots around the world have been mandated with this mRNA injection. Are, are there? That's that's maybe- true. And we, we have organizations all around the world, just like U.S. Freedom Flyers. And we have right. Aussie Freedom Flyers, U.K. Freedom Flyers. Uh, free to fly in Canada, um, several groups in Europe, and we're all pushing back. We actually came together under the banner of the Global Aviation Advocacy Coalition. Uh-huh. And the focus of that coalition is actually um, pushing back against the regulator, exactly what we're doing with the FAA, the civil aviation authorities in other countries. Uh, so that, that's a powerful force. Okay. We've joined together. We've shared information. And, and you know, these, these uh, regulatory agencies are, are being embarrassed around the world and, it, and it's gaining traction. Uh, we have you know, people like Senator Johnson talking about this, Good. Um, people in parliament in Europe. I mean, it's an issue that's definitely coming to the forefront. It affects everybody. So everyone listening, you can also email the FAA and phone them and 
Um, what you want to say is n no more mandating and amnesty for pilots. Is that correct, Josh Yoder? That and and testing and, and testing. testing. We need to get, get to the bottom of this. The, the mm -hmm. testing is very important because we can't treat a problem um, that that's not been identified. I mean, it's being it's being identified anecdotally. No. We're seeing no. problems all over the place. Um, mm -hmm. But this is something, and this isn't just for the vaccinated pilots. This is also for the unvaccinated, because unfortunately, shedding is a real phenomenon. Yes. And I, I personally know, I personally know unvaccinated pilots who have also contracted myocarditis. Um, so, Holy you know, th this is this is cause for major concern. We're not singling anyone out here. What we're talking about is ensuring that the skies are safe. Absolutely. And Thank we you. also we yes. also need to make the pilots aware that. We have ways to treat them and bring them back to the normal baseline so mm -hmm. that saying you have problems, getting evaluated, finding elevated troponin to D-dimers is not a flat not statement mm -hmm. that you're never going to fly again. It's, it's, like, it's like saying I have an infection and I'm not going to get over it. We have right. things that we can do and it doesn't have to destroy the pilot's career just to speak up that he or she might not be feeling great or that they're having problems. Understood. And can people find your protocol, your recommendations uh, somewhere, Dr. Levy, where should they go um, to find out more about how you believe they should treat themselves? Well, on my website, uh, peakenergy.com, there's a list of articles uh, on the article page. And that article says myocarditis, once rare, now common. Oh, yes. That discusses all the issues that we have. And it also discusses the therapeutic recommendations that I've made. Right, understood. And um, Josh, what is the website where people should go to support you? Please give the details. Sure, people can find us at usfreedomflyers.org. Um, we also have linked social media there. Please follow us on social media. If you would like to follow me on Twitter, I post a lot of information there. My handle is at Josh Yoder on Twitter. All right, fantastic. Thank you all for everything you're doing. Etana, do you want to wrap up? Is there anything else you want to yeah, add? Yeah, no, you you really covered a lot. Thank you so much, all of you, for being here. I know it's really busy and there's a lot going on. Um, but once again, please support the U.S. Freedom Flyers. Go to usfreedomflyers.org and it will you know, tell you how you can donate, how you can get involved. Um, and like Dr. Wolf said, we need to be reaching out to the FAA and demanding some accountability and some liability. So thank you, everybody, for being here and have a wonderful day. And you can follow us all at dailyclout.io. Yes. Um, and please do support us as well, Daily Clout, so we can keep bringing you this incredible journalism, um, cutting edge stories, accurate information, and Etana Hecht's wonderful reporting. Thank you all, gentlemen. Thank you, Etana. Bye-bye. Thank you. Take care.